Okay, let's get let's get started. Um, so my name is uh, Jesus Camacho Rodriguez. I'm part of the engineering team at Horton Works, um, working on Hive's optimizer. And today I'm going to talk about the, the work that we have been doing uh, for integrating Apache Hive uh, with Druid and uh, obtaining interactive analytics at, at scale. So let me start a bit with the motivation uh, for this work. So there are multiple BI and, and OLAP applications uh, that require interactive visualization of complex data streams. And these data streams, what they all have in common is that they have a time dimension. So you can imagine that you have your, um, your dashboard uh, that is actually emitting some auto-generated queries uh, to your database. And through those queries, you want to discover some, some correlation, some trend. And well, these events, as I said, they are based on time. So you have real-time uh, binding events. You can have all kinds of logs. You can have information about your sales, about your users. Uh, however, when you have this, uh, this kind of front end that is emitting uh, automatic queries to your, automatically generated queries to your, uh, your back end, um, querying the data at large scale uh, poses multiple challenges. And this is where uh, Druid came in, right? So um, Druid was developed at, at MetaMarkets. Uh, what they were having is an interactive uh, ad analytics uh, application or dashboard. And they realized that actually uh, current open source um, databases, sorry, could not uh, handle uh, the requirements, which were that um, you know you had to to obtain a really subsequent um, queries for uh, for a slice and dice uh, type of queries. Um, so yeah, the initial use case was interactive ad analytics. Uh, right now, I mean, since uh, its inception. Um, it has more than 150 contributors. It's used by uh, many organizations at petabyte scale. And the main features are those. So it's a, a column-oriented um, distributed data store. Um, it has batch and real-time ingestion, uh, scalable to petabytes of data. And the most important, important feature is, can, is that it can obtain subsequent response uh, for arbitrary time-based slice and dice queries. How do they do that? Well, they, as we will see, they partition the data by the time dimension. And then they have some uh, smart indexes and uh, automatic data summarization. And they can also uh, use some approximate algorithms in order to obtain your, your results. So this is how the Druid architecture looks like, um, you know, um, uh, at the uh, bigger scale. So you have three kind of nodes, broker, real time, and historical. So let's start with the indexing. Uh, when you want to index data, you can either do it in batch or in real time. So for the real time, you will have your uh, streaming system, Kafka, Storm, and then the real time nodes will be reading data from the streams and will uh, create segments um, that will be, uh, you know, after a certain period of time, they will be pushed to the, to the deep storage. Uh, at the deep storage, uh, Druid supports several, uh, several um, systems, S3, HDFS, Google, and so on. Uh, then for the uh, historical data, so imagine here it's not real-time data. What we have is data that is, for instance, sitting on HDFS. And then you want to load it into Druid, and you uh, want to run some queries on it. So what, what they usually did was uh, running some Hadoop or Spark uh, jobs that will uh, create the, uh, the segments, the data structures for, for Druid. And this, uh, this will be managed by the historical nodes. Um, then when the query comes, uh, for instance, from your, for your, from your dashboard, it will hit the broker. Okay? And the broker will contact the uh, real-time and historical nodes. It will retrieve some data, uh, pro possibly do some post-computation, and return the results to your uh, dashboard. Okay? So how does Druid store data? Uh, data is stored in segment files. And these segment files basically will store one uh, time granularity. So you will partition your data by time. So in, in this case, in the example, in the image, you see that it is, um, it is actually uh, stored by day. Uh, ideally, the segment files should be uh, small um, because 
they will, uh, I mean, Druid will have some smart caching of, of the segments and also it creates some internal data uh, structures to access those uh, segments quickly. Uh, if they grow large, you can do either two things. You can actually reduce your, um, reduce your granularity so you could store by hour, for instance. Or you can also uh, use uh, what they uh, call um, uh, sh uh, shades, I think, that is that you will have multiple copies. Uh, I mean, you will have uh, multiple segments for the same uh, time dimension, value for the time dimension. Then within a segment, um, Druid uh, will separate the columns in three types. So the timestamp, that as I said, is uh, mandatory. And then you have dimensions that are uh, the columns on which uh, you want to filter or you want to, um, to actually group by. And then you have metrics that are the, the columns on which you want to compute your, your aggregations. And yeah, so um, Druid will automatically generate some indexes to facilitate the fast uh, lookup and, and aggregation. Now, how do you query actually Druid? So what Druid exposes to the user or to the dashboards is an HTTP REST API. And the queries and results are expressed in JSON. So that's how a query looks like in, in Druid. Um, there are multiple query types. So the first two, time boundary and segment metadata, um, are, um, are queries that actually will help us obtain some information about our data sources. And then you have time series, top end, group by, select, and also there are other types that I didn't uh, specify there. Um, what is important is that in, in Druid, it's not only about expressing the, um, uh, the results that you want to obtain, it's also you should use the, um, the adequate type, because depending on the type of query that you submit to, um, to Druid, you will obtain different results. So just very quickly, you can see there the, the uh, query type. So it's a group by. You can see some data source that is equivalent to a table in, in Hive, um, some dimensions, some aggregations that we want to compute, and then some, um, some limit ordered by, and finally the intervals that we are interested in, 2010-2011. Uh, so after this um, uh, comes why it makes sense to integrate Druid with Hive. And, and it's because we think that it will bring uh, benefits to both systems. So first of all, we will be able to index uh, complex query results in Druid using Hive. So before, as I said, when you had your historical, uh, you had your data sitting in HDFS, you would run some, um, some Hadoop jobs. Um, but you know, the, the user would have to actually hard code this job. So now you can from Hive simply specify your query and the results of your query will be stored in Druid and they will be available to be queried. Also introducing a SQL interface on top of Druid. So as I said, um, the interface that it exposes is, uh, is a JSON interface. This is okay for some dashboards that already support uh, generating the queries in JSON format, but if you really want to use uh, Druid in, in, um, uh, for, uh, for more use cases, you have actually to, to have a SQL interface on top of it. A third one is being able to execute complex operations on Druid data. So uh, Druid is very good, uh, as we said, for, um, for slice and dice uh, on, your, um, on your database on time, but for instance, it doesn't support join. So if you want to do a join, uh, what you can do is that you will read your data from Druid, and then you will actually execute the join in Hive. And finally, it will also uh, bring benefits to Hive. Why? Because it will provide efficient execution of this kind of uh, all-up workloads. So let's go into, into details about uh, registering and creating Druid data sources from, from Hive. So here we have two different cases. Uh, first one is that your data is already sitting in, uh, in Druid, and what you want is to query it from Hive. So basically what you have to do is some data discovery. The second case is that your data is, um, is actually sitting in Hive, and you want to do some pre-computation with it, store it in Druid, and then query Druid in order to obtain uh, efficient performance. So let me go uh, over these two. So first, let's focus on how we will register Druid data sources from, from Hive. 
Um, we will use a simple create external table statement. So this is, it, 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 really, it is really how it looks like. I mean, you have create external table, um, the name of the table that we want to create in Hive, in this case, Druid table one. Uh, you need to specify that it will be stored by the Druid storage handler. That is what we have built in order to deal with the communication with uh, Druid from Hive. And then in the table properties, the only thing that you have to specify is uh, how the, uh, the Druid data source that you want the table to point to is called. So in this case, Wikiticker. Um, just a few notes. Uh, you will have to specify um, the broker node in your properties. So the broker node, so um, we know actually how to contact Druid from Hive. And as you can see, there is no uh, additional information about the schema. So what, uh, what Hive will do is to uh, query Druid in order to obtain information about the schema, about the timestamp, uh, dimension columns, and metric columns. You don't need to, spec to specify anything as a, as a user. The other, um, um, the other way of, um, of uh, the other, I mean, the other thing that we can do is indexing data in, um, in Druid from Hive. So in this case, what you can use is a create table as select statement. Um, it doesn't look much different than, than the other example. You just, you will not create an external table anymore. Um, you have also an additional property that is the segment granularity. This is something that, as I said before, you need to specify so, um, so Druid knows how your data is partitioned, so in this case by day. And then uh, you can specify your, your Hive query. In this case, it's a very simple query that will just read some data from some source, uh, some time, two dimensions, page and user, and, and two uh, metrics, uh, characters other, added and characters removed. So going into detail for, for this, um, once again, as a user, you don't need to specify anything. Um, we will actually infer the, uh, the Druid column type from the Hive column type. So if it is uh, numeric, it will be, um, it will be a metric. Uh, other, other columns will be dimensions, and then you will have the, the timestamp. So now, how, this, how does this um, work internally? is that you have your uh, create table as select physical plan, right? So in this case, it was a, a table scan, a select, and a file sync. You were selecting some columns, and you have, uh, uh, then you are, uh, the file sync is using the, draw, the Druid story, uh, output format, sorry, to, um, to store the data in Druid. So it will create segment files, and it will register these segment files with the, with the Druid Metastore. Um, but as, as, as we said before, Druid will need the data partition by, by time. So what we do is to rewrite the creatable as select uh, plan, we introduce a reduce phase that will, um, will introduce a column that truncates the timestamp to the granularity in this case. Um, and then like that, it will, it will be partitioned for the file sync to store it. So two records will end up in the, in the first segment, and three records will end up in the, in the second segment. So once you've done that, uh, your data is, is uh, ready to be, to be queried. So now let's move pre uh, precisely to querying uh, Druid data sources from Hive. So from a higher perspective, how does this work? So uh, when you have a query that is expressed on um, on a Hive table that is backed by, by Druid, um, uh, the automatic rewri rewriting will be triggered. Uh, this is powered by Apache Calcite, that is uh, the project that powers the um, Hive's optimizer. And the main challenge here is to push as much computation as possible to, um, to Druid and to identify the patterns in the logical plan that correspond to the different kind of, of Druid queries. Because as I mentioned before, it makes a difference a difference whether you express your queries one way or another. Then once we have done that and we have identified the parts that can be pushed to Druid, we'll translate the subplan of operators into a valid Druid JSON uh, query, that is the one that will be submitted to Druid. Um, this, this, by the way, this Druid query will be encapsulated into a Hive uh, table scan that will be actually the responsible to read back the results from Druid and create records that can go through the, um, through the Hive uh, pipeline. Um, finally, it might not be possible to push all computation to Druid. So 
there are parts, like we said, joins that cannot be pushed, but our contract is that the query should always be executed. So if you cannot push it to, to Druid, you will do the rest of the computation in Hive and you will return results for your, for your queries. So now, um, let's uh, show how it works with an example. You have this SQL query. Um, this is standard SQL. It will select the top 10 users that have added more characters from beginning of 2010 until the end of 2011. And if, uh, this is the, the, the logical plan you can see on the right. You have some Druid scan, then project, filter, aggregate, order by limit, and finally the sync. The first thing that you can observe there is that we can express the filter on the time dimension in, um, in uh, every possible uh, or in, in many possible uh, ways. This will be recognized by the optimizer, and the filter will be pushed to Druid. So let's get started. So at the beginning, you have um, only the Druid scan uh, will be executed in Druid, and this will be executed as a select query that reads all the data from, from Druid. And then we start, and the rest will be executed in Hive. And then we start triggering rewriting rules, right? First rewriting rule will push the project. I mean, it will check some preconditions um, to see whether it can be pushed to Druid. In this case, it can. Uh, we push it, and now, uh, the project and the Druid scan will be executed in Druid, and the rest will be executed in Hive. And we continue doing the same. So we apply an, a second rewriting rule. Now the filter is executed in Druid. Another rule, now we have pushed the aggregate and observe that now the type of Druid query has changed. We will be executing a group by query. And finally, we can also push um, the sort, uh, the order by limit. Okay, so in this case, it's the best case scenario. We can execute the full query in Druid, and uh, Hive just has to, to read the results and, and show them to the user. So when we translate that into a Hive plan, Hive physical plan, the whole Druid query when, will be encapsulated into the table scan, and then we'll have a file sync. And this table scan will use the input format to emit the query to Druid and to retrieve the results and, um, yeah, and either do some computation in Hive or return them to the user like in, in this specific case. Um, and yeah, finally, how the, actually how the Druid input format works. Um, we submit the query to Druid and generate records out of the query results. The current version, uh, time series, top end, and group by queries are not partitioned. So we will contact directly the broker node in Druid, um, hoping that, um, that the, the size of the results will be small. Uh, for select queries that can potential, potentially return more results, uh, we actually uh, bypass the broker node, and we will contact directly the real-time and historical nodes. Um, and that way, we can actually uh, parallelize the, the execution. So yeah, let me show you a very small uh, demo. So basically, I have taken, I mean, the, the implementation of, of, of the integration is, um, is being carried out in, in master, in Apache master. So it will be part of the next Apache Hive releases 2.3, uh, 3.0. Um, most probably, I mean, they have not been released yet, but the plan is to release them in the second quarter uh, this year, so in the, in the coming months. It relies on uh, Druid 0.9.2 and uh, Calcid 1.12 for the optimization. And what, I'm, what I have shown today in the presentation, everything is already uh, checking in master. Okay, we are already running some, some experiments and, and improving some, some things, but you can register um, data sources from Hive, you can uh, cre create them, you can overwrite some of your data, and you can delete Druid data sources from Hive, and then you can, you can query Druid from Hive. So let me show you a very short uh, demo. Yeah. Okay, that's gonna be difficult if I don't mirror it. Wait. 
Is it okay at the back? Yes? Okay. So, okay, let's get started. So, I created some uh, small database. So, two hive tables. Um, so, one of them, it has some, uh, oops, sorry. It has some information about users. Okay, and the other table has some information about product sales. Okay, so these are my Hive tables. They have a time dimension. And then, uh, actually, I can do like this to show better the columns. Um, I think that will be better. Yeah, so these are the columns, right? So we'll have a timestamp column, then we have two uh, dimensions that are product ID and user ID, and then, uh, sorry, an, an order type, three, three dimensions, and then we have a single metric in this case that is, uh, that is sales. Now, uh, what I'm gonna do, uh, the first thing, is actually to, um, okay, to configure, to configure Druid. So, I mean, to configure um, the interaction with Druid. So, this is all that we really need to, um, uh, yes, okay, that's not very safe. I know that's all right. Uh, so that's everything you need, basically. So you need uh, the, broker, uh, the broker address, you need the coordinator uh, address, um, and then you need actually the credentials for the uh, Druid Metastore, because when we actually store um, the segments in Druid, you, you need to register them with the, with the Druid Metastore. Okay, so once you, you have that, you are ready to go, basically. Um, so we could create, a, I mean, we could basically um, create a, a sales Druid table from the, uh, from the product sales. So we will take all the columns, and as we said before, the only thing that you need to specify is the Druid data source. In this case, it will be called uh, product sales index, and the granularity, that in, in this case, it's uh, the and now you run it. Yeah, it will take a bit of time. So basically what, um, hopefully, okay. Okay, it might take a bit of time to, to show up because I didn't change. There is some parameter that actually, um, you can change the interval on which you want to check whether the, um, the data source is available in the, in the historical, and I didn't change it for the demo, so it might take a, a little bit uh, longer. But in any case, what we are doing right now is that, uh, as you can see, we introduced this uh, reducer to phase, where you will actually partition your, uh, your data, and, um, and then we will, um, we will actually store this data in, in HDFS, create uh, the internal data structures that Druid needs, and uh, once this is done, you contact the Druid Metastore and you actually register these segments. And this should be happening soon. Uh, yes, live demo. Usually it doesn't take that long to load data. Um, let me see what's going on in the background. Not available yet. Okay, let's give it 10 more seconds, 15 more seconds. Um, otherwise, I have some uh, backup that I actually copy paste the content of the, um, of the console just in case something like this was uh, happening. Okay, okay, we made it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, so this work. Uh, so now you have your data in, uh, in Druid, and now you can finally uh, query it. So, um, sales Druid, and your data is there. And if we go to the explain plan, that probably is more interesting that, than querying the data itself in this case. You see what is happening here. So we are pushing all the computation to do it. I mean, this is a very simple select start query, right? And uh, what you can see is that attached to the table scan, 
you will have some additional information about uh, about the Dru the query that we are sending to Druid. So in this case, it is uh, here, right? Druid query JSON. So you have the query type that is select, uh, the data source on which we are um, that we are actually targeting, uh, the interval on which you are interested, uh, dimensions and metrics. Okay, and. You can run all all kind of uh, different queries. So let's run some. Um, okay, let's show this one because it's more interesting. So this basically will create. Let me copy paste it first. So this is just to prove you can have your data source, uh, one data source in Druid, one data source in Hive, and what this will do basically is to join both data sources and uh, and obtain the result. Um, I mean, this is completely transparent from the from the hive side. So let's. Uh, I'm afraid somebody's using the cluster at the same time. So um, so yes. So um, so there you can see the the results, and you can see also the um, the explain plan, how we actually executed this uh, this query, right? So we are basically executing the join on the on the hive side. So I just wanted to um, yeah to show a small small demo, nothing more. I I want to tell you that this is available uh, already on the open source community. Would be great to get uh, to get uh, some feedback. We are also um, preparing some uh, some blog post with some uh, some numbers um, where you can see actually the benefits that Druid brings to uh, to Hive. So finally, let's uh, focus on the on the road ahead. So, what is ahead of us? So, in the short term, we want to tighten this integration between Druid and Apache Hive and Apache Calcite. So, one of the things that we need to do is to recognize more functions because uh, this is important. So, we can actually push as much computation as possible um, to Druid. Uh, support. Uh, complex column types. Um, Druid supports some uh, approximate uh, uh, results for the metrics, some approximate metrics. So it could be interesting uh, at least to expose this uh, to the user in case uh, they want to use it. And, and finally, closing the gap between the semantics of the different systems. So this is not only improvements in, in the Hive side, but also on the Druid side. For instance, uh, null semantics are, are different in Druid. So these are some things that we have to work on so we can really rely um, on Druid to execute Hive queries. And then, um, so back to my initial example, how does this fit in the, in the broader perspective? Um, this fits with the support that we're implementing for uh, materialized views in, in Hive. So if, if you want to know more about this work, I invite you to come to, the, to my talk this afternoon. Uh, but basically, what you will have is your data stored in Hive. And then you will create some materialized views, some index in Druid to accelerate your uh, query workloads. And um, the system or the, the rewriting algorithm, what it will be able to do is to rewrite your input queries to automatically uh, use your views. So it's something that we are working on. And yeah, stay tuned in the, in the next few months uh, because there will be some, some news. And finally, uh, last but not uh, least, uh, some acknowledgments. So this is uh, three communities coming together and, and the work of, of uh, many people, not only myself. Uh, first of all, uh, Slim, he has been uh, uh, basically all the part of uh, indexing uh, data from, um, from Hive into Druid. Um, he pulled it out. Uh, Julian, Nishan, Asutos, Gunter, Carter, they all help, they all provide feedback. And, yeah, they are all part of the team. And that's it. With that, uh, questions? <laughs> yes. Well, 
Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So the question is uh, whether uh, Druid is uh, an independent entity, let's say, or part of, of Heist somehow. So it's it's completely independent. This, uh, uh, I mean, the project um, came out on, on its own um, uh, till we started integrating it with um, with Hive. Uh, there were even uh, dashboards I can think right now on, on Superset that actually can emit Druid uh, JSON queries directly. Um, so yeah, it's a project on its own. It has, uh, you know, we are using some of its capabilities that we're interested in for uh, for this kind of, of workloads. But uh, you know, it has also other capabilities, real-time ingestion. Um, so um, and and it has also support for many different. Uh, um, Storage, uh, different storage backends. So, so yeah, it's an entity on its own. It has its, its own execution internals, in its own um, uh, data storage models. So, yeah. Yes. So yes, so yeah, that, that I didn't mention. Uh, so um, so yeah, it's part of 2.6. There is a preliminary version. So Druid is part of HDP 2.6 that came out yesterday. Uh, the integration, there is a preliminary version of the integration with it. Yeah. So I think everything that I presented once again today is part of this uh, pre preliminary version. Uh, it's not GA yet, that part. Uh, we are going to work, uh, you know, uh, I guess in the next few months to uh, to stabilize and to um, to move uh, forward in that direction, uh, but yes, it's part of HTTP 2.6. Yes. Would all the security uh, so we've not done anything from the Hive perspective. Uh, probably you have to ask more uh, to actually uh, Druid team. Um, I know that they support integration with Knox. Um, uh, for authentication, um, and there has been some, because now it's a component of the HTTP platform, so there has been some integration. I mean, that's an effort to, to integrate with, uh, with other projects. I think there is also something related to Ranger, uh, but it's always at the Druid level. We don't do anything special from the Hive perspective, because after all, uh, from Hive, I mean, what you see is just a table, right, that uses a special uh, output format, input, sorry, input format, but that's all you see, so. Yes. Uh, okay. One over there. Yes. What is the first one? Solar. Uh, I don't. I mean, I I couldn't tell you. I mean, the specific differences between the systems. Uh, I mean, what I can tell you is that uh, Druid covers a very. I mean, it is very efficient because it covers a very specific use case that it's actually quite common with dashboards, that is this kind of, uh, of uh, time dimension queries. Uh, I don't know how it will compare with other systems. I, know, I, I mean, I can tell you that uh, it is complementary to LLP. So, you know, they play well together. We have already checked um, because, you know, um, Druid is more specialized. So it will be able even uh, it will be able to reduce even the times that uh, the response times that you get from LLP by two three x in, in a lot of cases, which is already I mean it's it's sub second and, and really in the order of uh, hundreds of milliseconds, which for you know large um, large databases is is great actually. So yes, one more I guess we have a bit of time. One more. Sorry? No, this will come. Uh, this will come soon. We are preparing a blog post uh, for uh, Hortonworks in Hortonworks. So, uh, so stay tuned. I think uh, maybe in the coming month or a couple of months you will see something. Yeah. So there will be some uh, information about, you know, a, let's say tutorial on how to how to integrate and to do everything that I show here today, and there will be some numbers how it compares actually with uh, with Hive on LLP and so on. Okay, so I will be here around today and tomorrow, so if you have any more questions you want to stop me, that's okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs>